My name is Victor Furman. Some call me the Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now, and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. People on the seeker's path from time immemorial have sought answers to the mysteries of life, life after life, our world and the universe. The mystic's goal has been that ultimate awakening, understanding, and connection, being one with everything. Many tools and methods have been used for attaining this goal, including meditation, ceremonial magic, and the natural pharmacopoeia that grows from our earth. Western experiments with psychedelic substances began in the 1940s, and by the time the late 60s arrived, were outlawed and classified as dangerous drugs. Yet evidence suggests that many of these substances, when used properly and in combination with traditional therapies, can help to allay and sometimes cure depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and even addictions. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, psychotherapist Dr. Rachel Harris, has done extensive scientific and personal research into ayahuasca, a psychedelic tea used in healing and ceremonies by indigenous peoples in the Amazon rainforest. Dr. Harris has been in private practice for 35 years. She received a National Institutes of Health New Investigators Award, has published more than 40 scientific studies in peer-reviewed journals, and has worked as a psychological consultant to Fortune 500 companies and the United Nations. She shares her findings and personal experience with ayahuasca in the fascinating new book, Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. Please welcome Dr. Rachel Harris. Good evening, Rachel. Thank you for having me, Victor. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So please share with us your professional path and how you first became interested in psychedelics for the treatment of emotional disease. Well, you know, what's missing in that biography, and it's missing because I didn't include it because it's sort of so old now, is in the late 60s, um, at, I graduated from college and I went directly to Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. And people have, um, that's kind of the missing piece in the story uh, because it was the late 60s, it was California, it was Big Sur, it was Esalen. I was in the residential program, which was a five month program, and there were just 11 of us in the group, and we met every week for about 50 hours a week. And the focus was on body work what now called embodiment kind of therapy, and um, meditation. So, uh, you know, I was a seeker back then, and uh, there were some good quality psychedelics available, and I used them very judiciously. I was only 21, but always in a very spiritual context. And, you know, I did that for a couple of years very sparingly, and then I found my way back to graduate school. Um, so it was, you know, many years passed, and then I sort of fell into an opportunity to um, return to my roots, shall we say. My daughter was grown and, and finishing graduate school, and I had an opportunity to drink ayahuasca. Now, what did you so first... That was, I'm sorry. That was right up my... I was going to say that I felt in some ways I was picking up my life where I had left off be- before I became a householder. You know, that term of family and raising a child and, and all that busyness. Absolutely. Now, when did you first learn or hear about ayahuasca? You know, the, my personal story is the exact opposite of what I recommend. So I'm in this awkward position of do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> but the truth is, I was um, in private practice in New Jersey. And it was the middle of winter, and I was looking for a beach vacation. And so I found this beautiful retreat center in Costa Rica by the Pacific Ocean, and, and I signed up for a week seminar, and I didn't pay much attention about what it was about. And a couple of days before I was supposed to leave, the organizer called and said, 
do you want to participate in the ceremonies? And I brilliantly said, what ceremonies? I mean, I had no clue. There were clues, but I missed them completely. And uh, so she explained what it was. And I said, well, give, give me a day or two and I'll call you back. I mean, it was last minute. But I happened to have a book about ayahuasca that I had bought because I liked, I'm a book buyer and I like the, the art on the cover. But I'd never read it, of course. So I read the book in a day or so and and I signed up for the ceremonies. And that's how I sort of found myself in a ceremony. Of course, I recommend to people be very careful where you go, check out the ceremony, know who's giving the medicine, you know, get as much information as you can, get good referrals. And honestly, I was just very lucky. Mm. It was over 10 years ago and and uh, I was just very, very lucky. I, I would really tell people, please don't do this. Let's think back to the late 60s and the early 70s. Um, we're sort of peers. We're in that same generation. Yeah. And, 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 the use of, and the use of psychedelics and what that was about for, for many of us. Um, I think that uh, those of us who were spiritual or had a spiritual bent to begin with were looking for yeah. something to take us into a deeper realm of that spiritual experience. Uh, did you find that it was helpful to you at that time? You know, I... It, the answer is yes. The um, Most people who have a mystical experience, no matter how it comes about, says, you know, this is one of the top five most meaningful experiences of my life. So it opened me up to that realm in a more dramatic way than I'd experienced that realm before. So I'd had those momentary, what Maslow called peak experiences, mm -hmm. but with uh, the psychedelic medicines, it was bigger than just a momentary peak experience. It was a real disillusion. And and um, so it was a more dramatic experience so that that, you know, once you've gone through that door, you 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 don't go back. Basically, it changes your whole worldview and how you see life. And so it confirmed for me a lot of what I was looking for. But it's not I didn't feel this is the only way to get there. Right. I, you know, it was a very careful use of psychedelics, which was unusual in the late 60s. But that's how, you know, the group I was with, we were or, more oriented in a serious spiritual way. Absolutely. Now, how long have the indigenous peoples of the Amazon been using ayahuasca as part of their healing and spiritual work? Well, you know, they also use it for very practical purposes. But there's there's some anthropological debate whether how many thousands of years they've been using it. You know, they have to find urns that have remnants of the tea in it. And so, you know, I've read four to six thousand years. And then some people say, no, it's just a couple of hundred years. So, I, you know, I listened uh, to the anthropological studies that said it was really ancient. And that's what I put in the book, that it's thousands of years. But they would use it. Um, to to have, um, you know, sort of extrasensory perception to know where the animals were in the jungle. So when they went out the next morning for a hunt, they would know where to catch the animals. So that's, you know, um, Westerners don't, that's not what we're looking for exactly. And also in the indigenous culture, they would use this medicine to get rid of um, um, uh, parasites because it really does clean you out. So there's, there's what they, the euphemism is purging, but it's really vomiting and diarrhea. And so it does clean out the whole intestinal tract. And, and in that process, it removes parasites. So that was really a health, a health reason in the, in the jungle. So it's so a medicine are, and it's a spiritual attunement device. What else? And, and people would use it to talk to relatives who had passed over or died um, you know, it was, and it was used to identify, you know, if someone was sleeping with your spouse or to try and do magic to get someone to sleep with you. So it had all level of uses and to make you more lucky in, in love or in life. So there were lots of different uses. But when they ask Westerners, what are you traveling to the Amazon to drink this tea? What is your purpose? It's mostly psychological healing and spiritual. Now, as, as the medicine becomes better known, um, more people, I think, are beginning to seek medical help for different kinds of diagnoses. 
but uh, that's that's more recent, even in just the last half a dozen years or so. Getting back to the indigenous peoples again, uh, was this uh, work limited to those who were shamans or who were uh, medicine people, or was it for everyone? Well, it depended on on the culture of the tribe. In some situations, only the shaman drank the medicine, and that would allow him to see the energy body of the patient and um, and diagnose what the problem was. I mean, really seeing the spiritual energy body and seeing identifying the shadows or you know the things that aren't the energies that aren't supposed to be there and having a way to get rid of them through singing to the person or blowing smoke on them, different kinds of approaches to get rid of um, energy that, that's not healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, in, but what's happened over the last few decades or so is now everybody drinks uh, together in a, in a circle, in a ceremony. For those who are not familiar with shamanism, the, the concept of the shaman is this person who's like a priest or a magical operator who looks at patterns of energy in nature and is able to work by restoring patterns that seem to be out of sync with what nature is supposed to be giving. And that's sort of the work of the shaman. And we'll be back with more of Dr. Rachel Harris and her fascinating book, Listening to Ayahuasca, after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Join me, Maggie Chula, on Mondays at noon Eastern for Mastermind with Maggie. Let's work together in a mastermind. We can resolve life's problems and create goals for the future. Build action steps empowering you to create your life in partnership with your divine source of light, your soul. Manifesting your goals can be simple and easy, so come with your problems and leave with a plan. The Akashic Master Teachers and I are waiting to help you. You're not wired to have a response to this sound. You're neutral to it. You hear it every time you finish a meal and never feel anything. But if we were able to associate this sound with a new stimulus, save the food, we've achieved pulling a natural response from you. Save the food. Why are we doing this, you may ask. Save the food. Because this ad is trying to change your after-meal behaviour through brainwashing. Because food waste costs the average family $1,500 a year. Save the food. Cha-ching. And 1500 extra bucks is like getting a pay raise. Save the food. Cha-ching. You're promoted. Which could pay for your child's braces. Save the food. Cha-ching. You're promoted. Check out my braces. So when you hear this sound, rethink your behaviour. Cook it. Store it. Share it. Just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. And we're back on Destination Unlimited. My guest this evening is Dr. Rachel Harris. She's the author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. So before the break, we were talking about the use of ayahuasca by the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Please share with our listeners what ayahuasca is actually made from. Right. It's a a tea, which means it's uh, plants that are boiled, but they're Um, It's two plants from the jungle, and when um, they're mixed together, uh, the chemical reaction makes the psychedelic uh, DMT in in one of the plants more available, able to be digested and enter the system of of humans. So if they only boiled 
a plant separately, it it wouldn't work. You wouldn't get the psychedelic effect. And the and the ayahuasca is a combination of the ayahuasca vine, which is a kind of woody vine that grows on trees, and uh, the shakruna plant, which is a member of the coffee family, I think, and it's the leaves from the shakruna. And anthropologists ask the indigenous people, well, how did you know to brew these two plants together? And the, the, in, the indigenous people just answer very matter-of-factly, well, the plants told us. Mm. So of all the plants in the, in the rainforest, the plants told them to put those two together. And in shamanistic uh, and cultures of that nature, talking to nature and communicating with nature and listening to nature. And listening, yes. Is, is how a lot of these wonderful medicines and, and treatments and discoveries, natural discoveries, come about. In your book, you talk about how when they prepared the ayahuasca, everything is done with intention. And the intention itself is part of that magic, isn't it? Well, that's from the shaman's point of view. I mean, what the shamans say is the songs you sing when you cut the vine, when you harvest the leaves, whether it's dawn or dusk, and uh, the shamans can identify different types of ayahuasca vines and shakruna bushes that um, Westerners don't differentiate, and they have different terms for them like sky, sky ayahuasca or black ayahuasca. I mean, they have different terms, but... For us, it's all the same plant. And so they say their thoughts, their intention as they harvest the plant makes all the difference in how the medicine turns out. Well, we, we don't know how to control for that in research. I mean, that's beyond what we know how to do. You know, in the Western society, we talk about people who cook, and there are people who cook. They throw something into a pot or a pan, and they cook it. And there are people who cook with love. And for some reason, the people who cook with love, the stuff just tastes better. And I think that's what we're talking about, that same effect. I think that's true. I think that's true. And so the attempt to do, there was one one um, group tried to do a, a, a study, a scientific study on ayahuasca, and they were going to use, they were going to control for potency and dose the way the researchers do in, in Barcelona, in Spain. And so they had the same freeze-dried capsules that they use in Spanish research. Um, they wanted to do a, a, an authentic shamanic ceremony, and the shamans refused. They said, this, the spirit, this is not living medicine. This, there's no spirit in this capsule. So that, that was the end of that research study. So it's good. this is going to be a difficult medicine to study. So the selection and harvesting and preparation is really a sacred process, isn't it? It is. It's a ceremony in itself. And, and there are a few um, Christian churches from Brazil that are um, m- making the tea for the use of their churches. And that's legal in two churches in the United States. They use it as a religious sacrament. And the, the, the preparation of the tea is as important as the church ceremony itself. So it is a sacred process. It's fascinating that a, uh, that a Christian church would actually employ this type of thing. But when you think about it... Well, it's, it's a Brazilian Christian church. <laughs> but, but I was going to say, but if you think about it, the use of incense, the use of wine in, in many ceremonies, all of these things, and with that sacred intention behind it, are similar in nature, aren't they? Yes, there is that sense of the mystery. And there was one, one um, I think he was from Central America, and he was, uh, he was um, an assistant to a shaman. And I asked him about, you know, how do you experience your, the relationship with, with uh, ayahuasca? And he said, well, to me, it's just like the relation, my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been a Catholic all my life. This is, feels very much the same. So, so much depends on your cultural background and belief system. Much in the same way that people who came from Africa, either through slavery or through immigration, uh, brought many of their traditions with them. And then when the uh, Christianization took place, uh, they incorporated and embraced many of those aspects together, as we find in Haiti and, and in the Vudun tradition. Yes, and that's true in Brazil very much. Uh, the Mbundu uh, religion that came from Africa does includes mediumship, where people are possessed and talk to spirits and 
do healing work on spirits. And that's actually part of one of the ayahuasca churches. It's a combination of um, Umbundu, where they work with spirits and Christianity and indigenous use of ayahuasca. And that's, that's, a, that's a Christian church, basically. And, and they're now in uh, Oregon. There are two branches in Oregon. And it, the case went to the Supreme Court, and they have the legal right to use this medicine as a religious sacrament. So, in other words, they're given the legal right because of the Establishment Clause. Yes. That's that's wonderful, actually. I think that it's really is wonderful. the freedom of religion, yeah. Yeah, freedom of religion, the Establishment Clause. Now, uh, we talked about ayahuasca as both uh, a medicine and uh, also as an instrument of spirituality. But the actual practitioners refer to it as medicine, don't they? They do. It is absolutely considered a medicine, uh, except for in the churches it's talked about as a sacrament. But yes, they, they, the, the distinction but about it not being a drug is very important. It's not addictive. Um, yes, there's a chemical reaction, but it's not. it doesn't have any of the con- negative connotations of being a drug. Even though the psychedelic element in ayahuasca is, in a, is considered to be illegal, but the culture holds it as a medicine that it's it's used for spiritual healing. Absolutely. Now let's talk a little bit about your experience with ayahuasca. In your book, you refer to ayahuasca as grandmother ayahuasca. We often think of grandmother as a source of great wisdom, compassion, comfort, and unconditional love. Why do you refer to grandmother ayahuasca? Well, that for it's not a hundred percent, but most of most of um, the 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 cultural use of ayahuasca sees the plant spirit as as a, a wise woman. I think there are a few tribes that see see ayahuasca as masculine, but for the most part, she's considered a grandmother. And um, you're exactly right; she has that kind of kind, loving. Um, care for you that a grandmother would and she also can be kind of tough I mean I think the best example of grandmother ayahuasca is she told a 20 something guy go home clean up your room and cut your hair (laughs) (laughs) you know I actually thought it was very good advice he wasn't thrilled with it he wanted something more you know spiritual and and esoteric but I think he got very good advice so she can be very practical and direct in those kinds of ways. And it's very much a, a grandmother loving, caring, and an honest voice. And in indigenous cultures, we often hear of, of Mother Earth and Father Sky and, and the use of, of, of a relationship to the people because they consider these to be their relatives. They consider these to be actual beings or entities that are related to them. Well, you know... Yes, it is really all about the relationship. And so in, I, in the research study I did, I, I focused on Western use of how, how is this medicine being used in North America. So it was sort of an underground research study. And one of the questions I asked was, um, do you have an ongoing relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca? So I didn't want to get into female or male or, you know, I wanted to leave it open. A relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca. There were 81 people in the study, 75% of them, that's 54 Westerners, said they had an ongoing relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca. And they communicated with this spirit in dreams, meditation, quiet moments, driving the car. I mean, they would sort of think of her and feel a connection. Um, A couple said, yes, I see her as a, a sexy, seductive woman. So that's not quite the same grandmother image. But it basically was a feminine image and always available, a sense that they could tune in and be supported and guided by this plant spirit. But I this remember, is, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, this is an amazing finding that 75% of the people felt this way because this is not normal Western worldview. You, you know, we don't really believe in plant spirits here in the West, and yet... These people were were engaging in this ongoing relationship with seemingly um, little conflict. I remember as a young uh, boy, as a child, 
uh, if I were with my grandmother and something were bothering me or I was upset that I could find comfort, she would hold me and then yeah. comfort me in that way. Do people identify with that the same way? Well, be, you know, they can't be physically held exactly, but people do report in the ceremony kind of a mystical experience of being loved in a, in a way that's an ecstatic cosmic kind of love, like being a child, loved as a child of the universe. And that, they, they say, you know, that, that went right into my DNA and changed me forever. So it's that kind of mystical experience of love. That's wonderful that the people can sense a feeling of being embraced or loved that way uh, by, by, really by Mother Earth, if you think about it. Yes, Mother Nature, Mother Earth. Yes, we have a lot of different terms for the same energy. That's wonderful. Yes, and it's, that experience can be incredibly healing psychologically. Oh, absolutely. My guest tonight is Dr. Rachel Harris. She's the author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. And uh, Rachel, please tell our listeners where they can get your book. Well, it's available on Amazon and anywhere the books are sold. And I have a website people can go to, and that's listeningtoayahuasca.com. That's wonderful. And we'll be back with more of Rachel Harris and listening to Ayahuasca after these words from the OM Times Radio Network. Are you in an interfaith relationship and thinking of getting married? For 18 years, Rev. Lori Sue Brockway has been creating personalized, loving, and romantic ceremonies for couples of all faiths and cultural backgrounds. Rev. Lori Sue's sensitivity to the needs of interfaith couples is reflected in the compassionate and inclusive way she addresses the concerns of parents and families. Rev. Lori Sue is also the author of several best-selling books on interfaith weddings and wedding vows. Selected as one of the top interfaith officiants by New York Magazine, Reverend Lori Sue serves couples in the New York metropolitan area and beyond. Find out more at her website, yourinterfaithwedding.com. Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. You wanted to see me? Yes, please, have a seat. So here's the thing. When this company brought you on, we took a chance on you. You didn't have that four-year college degree we typically look for. Right. But we gave you a shot anyway. And since then, you've worked incredibly hard and given it your all. Thanks. You've been an important asset to the team. But I don't think you can be an intern here anymore. <sighs> we want to hire you. You're, you're serious? Absolutely. Find your next great employee. Introduce yourself to the grads of life. Who are they? Talent worth knowing about. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. I won't let you down. I know. Don't miss out on a resource many innovative companies have already discovered. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. And we're back on Destination Unlimited. My guest this evening is Rachel Harris. She's the author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. A few weeks back, I caught an episode of the National Geographic series Breakthrough. And this one documented the use of psychedelics to cure addictions to everything from nicotine to heroin. It portrayed psychedelics as a form of scrubber of the area of the brain that gets dopamine reinforcement from the addictive substance or the addictive act. Now, does ayahuasca work in a similar way? 
you know, they yes, all the all the psychedelics work in a in a similar way. And uh, there's there's a little known story that it was I guess it's Bill W who started AA, yeah. and and people do know he had that I think he had a white light experience, a big spiritual experience, and after that he started AA. But he was actually in a hospital <laughs> under, um, he was under the influence of Datura, which is not a great drug, but it's a, it's a sort of a psychedelic dissociative drug. And he had this mystical experience under the influence of that drug. And he didn't talk about it that way, but he, he talked about it as a mystical experience, but he edited out the drug part of it. So y- yes, it's, it's, we, we don't, you know, the research that's going on with LSD and psilocybin, they're getting, they're really focusing on uh, getting the right dose for people to have a, what they call a complete mystical experience. And they're finding that that's the critical therapeutic variable. People are more able to stop smoking, stop drinking. Um, it relieves their death anxiety. They're better able to um face their own terminal cancer, for instance. And, and so that's the healing experience. But ayahuasca has such, it's not so predictable. I mean, the range of experiences that people report are incredibly variable. And you don't know if you're going to relive a childhood trauma or, you know, take a rocket ship up into the cosmos and, or, any, or talk to a dead relative. It could be any, any of the above. Um, but I, I was talking with someone just the other day, and she was just, let me think, she was three days after a ceremony. And she said, you know, I've had this coffee addiction all my adult life. I drink really intense three to five cups of coffee a day. And, um, you know, uh, and since the ceremony, it doesn't taste good to me. Mm. So I'm trying to recover it so it tastes good. But I understand that after the ceremony, maybe I should be stopping so this is someone talking about a coffee addiction. I mean, we don't usually think of this as a major mental health problem. But I, and what I said to her was, well, you have a choice. This is that wonderful few days or so after ceremony where you really have a, a, the opportunity to make conscious decisions to reprogram yourself and do things differently in your life. And I don't know if she's quitting coffee or not, but she could see that she had the choice. Absolutely. You know, I'm not a, a neuroscientist in any sense of the, of the, of the word, um, but in studying this process that they were talking about, um, the explanation is, uh, the scientific explanation, the medical explanation, is that there's a place called the mesolimbic pathway. And when the uh, person is stimulated by whatever the addictive substances, be it caffeine, nicotine, heroin, uh, sex, whatever the addictive trigger is that the mesolimbic pathway releases dopamine it's the reward centers into right into a place called the nucleus accumbens is what they called it and that what they're saying is from the scientific standpoint or from the medical standpoint is that the psychedelic sort of scrubs the nucleus accumbens and gives you a fresh start and that's what that experience is like are you familiar with that no, you have to send me that reference. That's fascinating. Absolutely. I'd, yeah. I'd love to see that, that research. I, 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 I have not seen that yet. Excellent. You know, this is a very exciting time. There's, there's lots of studies going on all over the world. And um, in countries that we don't even, you know, there was a Bulgaria Association of Psychedelic Research, countries we don't usually think of involved in this sort of thing. And um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of, work that comes out in just the next couple of years so it is very exciting you know it's funny when you think about the fact that cannabis marijuana uh, is still considered a class one drug in this country and yet extracts from cannabis can cure according to many of the studies that i've read and some of the literature that i've read uh, can cure things from seizures seizure disorders uh, to uh, chronic pain uh, there are just so many things that come from nature that if we grow up or <laughs> grow up as a society <laughs> and and do this in a very in a very responsible way, what wonders we could find and what healing we could find. I think we're I think we're right at that verge with research. I think we're really beginning to discover 
um, real opportunities for healing and, and treatment benefits. But, you know, we really do have to reclassify these medicines. They are considered addictive with no therapeutic benefit. And um, even though almost half the states have therapeutic marijuana now, uh, our laws have not caught up to, to, the, the, to the new state laws. And so we really have to get more rational about this whole thing. It's amazing and, to me that uh, if you're of age, you can buy alcohol in any place yeah. in this country except for maybe the blue areas. And, and alcohol, as far as I'm concerned, especially alcohol addiction, is so much more destructive than any of these substances would be. Right, and, and so is the uh, the painkiller, the opioids. And the opioids, are absolutely. Really yeah. devastating the, our culture. And, and uh, here we have these medicines that can really help people and and, you know, the, the research is headed in two directions. There's research with MDMA, which is technically not a psychedelic, but they're using it for uh, PTSD. And they're using it for the worst cases of PTSD, the people who have failed at every other treatment and suffered with PTSD for decades. And so um, they figure, you know, if they can show that it helps them, then it certainly it will help many more people. So there's that research, and, and MDMA is ecstasy. And then the other line is using uh, psilocybin or LSD with people with terminal cancer who have what's called a death anxiety, and, and they often have more pain, more discomfort, and they're just suffering with the, the prospect of dying. And one psilocybin day, and they're, they're far more accepting of their situation and able to have better quality time, <clears throat> excuse me, with their family, and they're in less pain. Absolutely. Without opioids, without painkiller, they're just in less pain. So, you know, we're discovering these really important medical purposes for these medicines, and it, it begins to become obvious that we have to reschedule the drugs. Please share some of your experiences uh, with other folks who have been using ayahuasca in terms of depression, PTSD, and addictions. Well, you know, some people just wake up the next morning, one ceremony, the next morning they wake up, and they say, I'm never touching alcohol again. I can see it's a poison. And, you know, that, and, and I, follow, I follow people, you know, I'm both a therapist and a researcher. I want to know what's going to happen in the next couple of months. And, and I'm relentless. I've, I have been in touch with people for years. <laughs> and, you know, they are not, they are out of trouble. I've seen some people in trouble with alcohol. They have one ceremony and they really basically never drink again. Mm. Some people report that with depression as well, that the depression just lifts. Other people need to have recurring ceremonies, and they, they, you know, it's not a one-shot wonder, what I actually called a miracle cure. They need to keep using the medicine, but it's not an addictive use. It's just as the medicine clears the body in a few weeks, they, they need to attend another ceremony to, again, lift the grip of a major depression. Well, and, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say the other thing is if, if people report, you know, they do, an, they talk about it in an interesting way. And some people wrote, well, I still have some depression, some anxiety, but I have a different attitude toward it. It doesn't bother me as much. <laughs> so they sort of have a disidentification with it, a little more therapeutic distance. They don't get stuck in that feeling of, oh, no, am I going to be depressed forever? They sort of have uh, the objectivity, say, well, this you know, this will pass. I, I understand every once in a while I get a little depressed, but I know this will pass. And so it's a different attitude. So there's all these different ranges of experiences that are, are incredibly therapeutic. And that's part of my excitement about this medicine. But, you know, we do have to spend a little time on the dangers involved. Absolutely. We're, we're going to touch upon that in a minute, but I, I wanted to follow up with you. What about how does the use of ayahuasca after the experience affect people's relationships? Well, you know, people um, feel better about themselves. They're, they're, the way they relate to themselves improves. So they're more self-accepting and more self-compassionate. And they're less um, under the weather with, with moods. 
So that makes them more available for relationships. And people often talk about yearning for more authentic relationships. So people sort of come out of their shell and want to talk more and have more honest, open relationships. It's very interesting that they use that word authentic repeatedly. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. Authentic meaning being honest and open. Yes, more real and more serious relationships people talk about. I don't want to just play the field anymore. I want a really meaningful relationship. I mean, one woman said, I don't even make out with anyone anymore. If it's not a real relationship, I'm not interested. I mean, I got answers. You know, people wrote essay questions, answers to essay questions. So I got that kind of detail. It was fascinating. And what about their religious experience after the ayahuasca experience? Well, people have a real change in worldview. And um, they generally feel more connected to, as you say, Mother Nature, to nature. They want to spend more time in nature. And they feel more um, a sense of wanting to protect the ecology and the planet. So there's that sense of more involvement with a a spiritual ecology. And people also report um, that sense of oneness with the universe and being a part of the universe. So they have that spiritual, mystical experience of unity. And it also shifts their relationship to the other side, to people who have died. I mean, people frequently report, you know, ongoing conversations with relatives or loved ones who have died. And that changes people's philosophy, you know, sense of reality as well. Absolutely. My guest is Dr. Rachel Harris. She's the author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. And we'll be back with more after these words from the OM Times Radio Network. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Hailing Light, on Ohm Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Hailing Light, we want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have Meals on Wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. On Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening, Dr. Rachel Harris, author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. So, Rachel, prior to the break, we were talking about all the wonderful and positive benefits of ayahuasca, but you also talk about the shadow side of ayahuasca. Please tell us about that. Right. Um, There are real medical concerns. So if somebody is already on um, antidepressants, they really should not drink ayahuasca. There's a risk of serotonin syndrome. 
So people have to be very careful about mixing any any of the antidepressants with with ayahuasca, and uh, they should really get medical help with with that decision. And and then the other thing is there have been some, or if anyone has a history of psychosis or mania, I don't think it's worth the risk. Um, what I started to say was there have also been some reports of shaman behaving badly. Um, and, you know, <laughs> like, a, I know, yeah. <laughs> I, maybe there's a better way to say that. But like, you know, we've seen so many spiritual teachers and Catholic priests come and go and, and behave badly. And so... The shaman are too, and so there are cases and stories of of rape, and the shamans have access to lots of plant medicines that will make someone. Uh, it's almost like a a, a a date rape drug. So uh, people have to be very careful where they go for a ceremony um, in in South America, and and it's always best to go with someone who's who's going to kind of be a partner and look after you. Absolutely. You know, it just, it seems, it seems when you talk about people who are subject to psychosis or people who've had other issues of that nature, uh, remembering back in the 60s when they used to talk about a bad trip, and it seems that people who had a fairly good mind and and were not people who were prone to depression or, or emotional upset seem to have fairly fairly pleasant experiences with psychedelics and those who were deposed were disposed to uh, negative experience would have the bad trips and i guess what you're saying is pretty much the same with ayahuasca well some people do have to be more careful but it also don't forget the setting so it's very important that you feel that you're in a safe situation safety is always important and 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 we all have to learn um, with any of these medicines, never to leave anybody alone. People can become very frightened and, and move into anxiety if they're alone in an altered state. And so we have to learn how to take care of each other better in these situations. And what are the physical negatives of ayahuasca? Well, I can tell you it's not going to be a recreational um, medicine because you really do have to be close to a bathroom and everyone gets a little bucket to purge into. So it's really, frankly, no fun at all. And um, and because so it's not only, you know, the awkwardness of vomiting or or having diarrhea. It's, you know, it's not exactly what you want to do at a party or, or a music concert. There's also you don't know what kind of experience you're going to have. So some people, um, cry. I mean, I've had experiences where I cried for six hours. Well, I don't really want to be in a music concert crying. I mean, you know, I want to have a safe situation where I can move through that experience, whatever it is. So um, it's people generally have pretty emotional experiences. Uh, you can you can kind of count at some time that that's the that emotional stuff is going to come up. And so you want to really be in a safe, protected, kind of healing atmosphere. Mm. So ayahuasca is a natural emetic then, something like Ipecac, right? It's a, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a purgative. Right, okay. So, yeah, it's, so it's a natural, there's a natural instinct to vomit. Do the, do the shamans use that if someone, or the medicine people use that if someone accidentally ingests a poison or is accidentally poisoned to bring the poison back up? You know that's a great question. I have to ask about that. I don't. I, you, it would make perfect sense, but I don't really know for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about your personal experience with ayahuasca. First of all, what was it like drinking the tea? Well, the tea is just plain disgusting. I mean, you know, there's almost a competition among people writing about this medicine who can who can best describe this awful tasting stuff. Um, and so you you really have to just get it down somehow and keep it down. How much so, do you have to consume? Well, that that also varies tremendously, and so you know it's very hard to control for what what's the right dosage. I mean, I, I personally I need very very little to have a full experience. So I'm it can sit in a situation where other people are drinking two full cups, and I've had a couple of tablespoons. And so the, the, how people respond to this medicine varies widely. And I, I remember there was one woman who was a sophisticated user. She was experienced, and, and she was in a ceremony, and nothing happened. So she took a second cup, 
nothing happened. And she had kind of a long, boring night and figured, oh, well, I don't know what went wrong. Everyone else had an experience and I didn't. And she told me she was driving home and she had to pull off the road because she started sobbing. And um, she was um, having a conversation in her head with um, a sibling who she was having trouble with. And uh, she pulled off the road and sort of had this therapy session with herself, um, talking to her sibling and and answering and, and working things out. And she said, you know, it went on a long time. I was on the side of the road for an hour and I was crying and talking and And then, you know, I felt like I got to the other side of it and I drove home and I got a good night's sleep and I called my sibling the next day and we've been doing much better ever since. Mm. (laughs) So, but she had no reaction to the medicine. Mm. She thought nothing happened. And then she has this breakthrough. Mm. So we, there's so much mystery. That's, that's what's, it's part of what's fascinating to me. And what were your mystical experiences like when using the ayahuasca? You know, my first experience, I, you know, people talk about, well, you should have an intention. And, and I had an intention. Of course, you, you never, you don't really have control exactly, so you don't know what you're going to get. But my intention was to go back to my experience when my father was dying. He was in my home under hospice care. And it was a very intense, you know, 36, 48 hours as he was actively dying. And I wanted to go back to my, to that point, to that experience. And in that ceremony, I I went back and I relived my very last conversation with my father. And um, I sort of traveled with him as he was dying. And what I experienced in the ceremony was like a rocket ship shooting up into the cosmos. And, and, you know, I entered that expansive black void where there are, you know, maybe some twinkling stars very far away and where there's no longer an eye. So I can't say I experienced this. I, I disappeared into that cosmic void. And at some point, and of course, I have no idea when or how. I came back down into my body and into, into, you know, down to earth. And um, that experience, you know, it it gave me such a wonderful sense of connection to my father and a sense of uh, maybe this is a lesson in how to die. Maybe this is preparation for me. Did it give you a healing from the hospice experience? It it gave me a healing with my father. Mm. It did. There was a healing of the loss of my father. And also um, an affirmation of the ways my father was wonderful and a forgiveness of the ways where he, you know, was a workaholic and wasn't there for me and didn't get me and those those kinds of things. So there was there was a healing for the relationship as a whole. Do other people or do people who have had grief issues, grief trauma, find healing through this process? Well, you know, someone reported this interesting experience, and and I had a very similar, I'll talk about mine, because I've heard this story a couple of times, is I had a a very close childhood friend, and he killed himself in his early 30s, and I sort of never got over that suicide, and in one ceremony, I got to see him and talk to him and feel connected to him, and so there's this sense of renewing a relationship. I mean, he's been gone now 40 years, but I have a sense of an ongoing relationship with him. And, and that, and so I feel healed of the worry that I had for him and the pain uh, of losing him, but also of his pain that he was in such terrible pain. So there's a resolution that happens and a connection that's very healing. And what about healing of perceived or real hurts from others? You know, people relive trauma. I mean, real, real abusive sexual and physical traumas. And people can sometimes relive them as if they're a child again, and it's happening now. And um, so they might get more information about what that what happened during that trauma that they they hadn't known before. They might get more information that they have to face and deal with. 
And then some people see the traumas as if they're watching a TV program and they see that, that this is, they see themselves as a child and they see the perpetrator, but they have a, a distance and they have their grown up brain and they know they're safe. And so there's sort of a therapeutic um, process of watching this. And people often report even feeling, well, certainly compassion for themselves, but some people even feel compassion for the perpetrator. Mm, so so it's, it's, a, but it's that therapeutic distance that allows for that. A sense of forgiveness. Can be. Wonderful. With some people, yeah. Wonderful. My guest, Rachel Harris. Her book is called Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. Rachel, what would you like your readers to take away from the book? Well, you know, I, I certainly want people to be very careful if they're going to travel in these realms. So I want them to take that. But because I've been a therapist most of my life, um, I hope people who, who do enter into these realms, um, into spiritual realms and have these kinds of healing experiences, that they'll um, consider psychotherapy afterwards. There's certainly an integration process after the ceremony so that they can really integrate what they've experienced and change their lives. That's what I'm, I'm really most interested about, is how are you different? How is your life different? And some people need a little help to make those leaps. Absolutely. Listeningtoayahuasca.com is her website. The book, Listening to Ayahuasca, available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever wonderful books are sold. Rachel Harris, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Victor. It's been really lovely talking with you. And you. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 